Five. Here we go. Hi, everybody. All right, not yet. <laughs> it, it takes us. <laughs> All right, here we are, and let's see how technology goes today. All right, I think we are. Okay, awesome. Hi, everybody. It's good to see you today. Good morning. So yeah, um, again, this is Heather Tankersley with Magnolia Realty. I'm here in Austin, Texas, and also do quite a bit in Southeast Florida. And I am here with my partner in crime on these, these Wednesday, Wealth Wednesday calls with, with Karen here. Hi guys, Karen Schaefer with Remax Properties here in Southern Colorado. It's great to have you on the call today. Thanks for joining us. Awesome. And, you know, as, as we just start each week, just a, a quick reminder that, um, you know, this is for educational purposes. There are no guarantees of income, um, no claims that, you know, anybody will or will not make any money um, or, you know, not lose money. And we always certainly recommend that you consult with legal and competent tax and legal professionals for any questions that you have about, you know, contracts, legal issues, finances, taxes, all of the above. So, with that, and uh, as, go ahead. As, I was going to say, as we go today, if you guys have questions about anything um, real estate related, the top the topic that we're going to discuss, or your own investment properties, please just leave it in the comments below, and we will definitely follow up with you. Absolutely. Um, and so last week we talked a little bit about sort of what was going on in the just kind of in the market. And then Karen, I didn't tell you, so I had an open house on a home this past weekend. And I met a gentleman and I don't think I have one of them here handy, but I did some infographics on the market. And so I did our local neighborhood and then I did Travis County as a whole. And so for instance, uh, the county November over November median home price jumped almost 21% year over year, um, just different stats and so on. And so this, this guy comes and he says, well, how, where, where'd you get these numbers? And so, you know, thinking, well, where are they going with this? And so I, yeah. I, I just said, um, from our MLS and, and the board, and he says, oh, okay, cool. Well, it turns out that he's a real estate data guy. So it got, it was real interesting to have the conversation with him because he is kind of, was kind of like we were talking about where we look at what's actually going on. So instead of just saying, you know, oh, well, I'm looking at a chart, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Um, let's look at the underlying factors and, and I'll butcher it. I'm going to end up actually having him on a zoom or a facebook live to just kind of talk about where markets are going like how real estate uh, anal analyzers do their work and so forth but he was saying that um you've got to look at the underlying conditions which we obviously all know but just uh, you know not this the factors that you know the media necessarily talks about because when the media is saying it's a great market to be in real estate chances are it's really not a great market to buy in it's a great market to sell in so mm -hmm. when the media and all the gurus are no longer out there you know pitching free seminars and all those good things and you know it's not on you know the market's going up the market's going up when all of that stops that's when it's really good to buy or when there's other conditions or factors that not everybody is is really paying close attention to or they simply just don't know how to connect the dots so last week we talked a bit about covid really and politics yeah. and and 2020 which has been a year for the the record books of course and we talked about how it, and it doesn't look like congress true to to Form is going to get anything done <laughs> anyway. So uh, uh, if nothing changes, the eviction moratorium ends on uh, December 31st. And so what that means is people that either have been unable to pay their rent, have chosen not to pay their rent. And I know some of you might be thinking, well, no, people wouldn't do that. I <laughs> knowledge of, of somebody that did. So, mm -hmm. so um, whatever the reason, landlords are now going to be able to move forward with the eviction. And mm -hmm. again, we talked about localized things. We talked about um, every market's different. So some places it's going to be a lot easier than others to evict people. You know, some tenants may be seasoned at playing the game and may know how to work the system a little bit. And then others just may say, okay, well, uh, you know, this is the deal, the, the, you know, our eight or nine months are up and it's time to move on. So whatever it is, 
there's going to be an opportunity. So I don't know if Karen, you want to kind of chat a little bit about your thoughts before we go into kind of the mechanics. Yeah, so we're we're going to talk a little bit about you know the the rental side of things and how COVID has affected that. Um, uh, and so what's interesting to me, Heather, on this topic is that. Um, and this is going to sound like we're very pro landlord, which, you know, let's call a spade a spade. We are because we're landlords or have been or will be, you know, in the future. Um, but uh, and we've also had some great tenants. So I want to preface this by saying that I don't feel like I'm backpedaling by saying that, because the truth is, is during all of this, um, myself and my husband, all of our rentals stayed full and everybody paid every single month, just like normal. So we really feel very blessed by that and we're grateful for it. Um, but what people don't understand is, you know, when they say, oh, the tenant didn't pay. Well, unfortunately what happens is, you know, it's that generally like that one guy that gives a lot of other people a bad name. Same in our industry, right, Heather? Like same with real estate agents, you know, you get one or two bad ones and then we all have a bad name. And that's the same the with, Bruce, you know. <laughs> right, right. And so it's a kind of similar with tenants in that, yeah, there are some good ones, but there's also some bad ones and the bad ones give a lot of the other ones a bad name. So what happened during all this time was that, you know, a lot of the tenants um, during COVID chose not to pay versus couldn't pay. And that's the difference is some tenants chose not to pay. Well, what happens now next is that the landlord did not get that same moratorium. And so the landlord still has to pay. And many people think, well, the landlord, oh, that's okay because they're rich or whatever. It's, it's not the case, you guys. I live in a very um, heavy military town. So a lot of times the military, for example, will come in, they'll buy a house, they get transferred in three years, and maybe they couldn't sell their house or uh, not be, maybe because of market conditions, maybe because they were moving so fast, maybe because they said, you know what, I'm young and I'm really going to try hard to hold some rentals so that when I retire, I have, you know, I'm not reliant upon the system per se. Um, but so these, these kids basically- you know, I would say that's probably the majority of people that own single family homes are just hardworking people. Yeah. They own a handful of homes like, and I hate to say rich because it makes it sound like people that <clears throat> have done well for themselves are bad, but right. kind of the wealthy professional investors are actually not, as often buying the, you know, single family to fourplexes, they're buying, you know, 10, 12, 20, 50, hundred plus units. So your average yeah. single family or duplex or even quad is owned by somebody who may have a couple still probably has a day job and are just is looking for a way they're to, growing. yeah, right. so they're not dependent on social security when they retire. Yeah. And that's, that's really where Heather and I started too, just so everybody knows, right, Heather? I mean, we, we, we didn't start wealthy. We didn't start any of that. We just said, Hey, this would be smart if we could, you know, hold a property. If we could see what that looks like long-term for Pete and I, we look at that as though that's our retirement. But my point is, is that a lot of times it's, it's just like Heather said, it's people that are working, they're deciding to help build their future and they're not wealthy. And to make an extra payment that month is huge for them. And really to make six extra payments, which is kind of what this is going to amount to, could sink them. So now they could go into foreclosure or something else. So that's or really their what- credit could get damaged, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. All that stuff. So that's why this is concerning for us. It's why it's a topic that we want to deal with because we want to talk about it from both sides. And, you know, we realize a lot of people really got affected during COVID and we totally get that. It doesn't change the fact that now we have these issues that we need to deal with, which is what we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, you know, last week and Karen kind of um, reiterated that there's just a lot of people that either for whatever reason couldn't or aren't paying rent. And so at the end of the day, that is kind of, let's take the human piece out of it because, and I know you can be like, well, you can't real estate people, people, you know, we got to be compassionate, but at some point we got to pay the piper. Somebody has to, so let's just eliminate, let's just go, you know, let's take the emotion out and just go, you know, facts, business, business, business at this point. So now there's uh, the landlords are going to come and say, I need my property back. And I need to either re-rent it or I need to sell my home because I can no longer afford to do this, nor should I have to, nor do I want to, because, you right. know, I'm having to work hard and keep my family afloat as well. So 
all of a sudden we have a, a landlords in different ends of the spectrum, super compassionate. Like I get there in a bad situation. I really wish I could help them, but I can't do this anymore. All the way to holy crap. I think that <laughs> Satan spawned my tenants and I just don't ever <laughs> want to have another rental property again. <laughs> so, I love that you use holy and crap and Satan all in the same sentence. I didn't know that was I'm like, gifted. Yeah. I'm yeah. Good. <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, so what happens now is we say, okay, well, how do we find these people? And so that's what we wanted to talk about on today's episode is how we're going to go about finding these people that may or may not be sick and tired of rentals. <clears throat> now, again, every market's going to be very different, but don't just say, hey, we're in a hot market like Austin, Texas. It doesn't happen. Like I said, I know firsthand um, of, of at least one case where the, the owner's just sick and tired and doesn't want anything to do with a renter in the foreseeable future. So, you know, and then more distressed markets where the economy's taken more of a hit is going to be even more of an impact. So the, the first thing we need to do is say, okay, well, how are we going to find these people? There's not like a, a registered database of, hey, I have pain in the neck tenants. Mm -hmm. You know, there's just nowhere to find those people. There, there should be. <laughs> there should be. There should be the database. Yes. Right. Um, and so what we need to do now is say, well, how are we going to find these people? What's the most strategic way to get in front of them? Because we're not going to get in front of them 100% only those folks. So there's a couple of things we can do. One, we can certainly advertise on social media. And, you know, if you have a certain farm area that you're in, you can narrow down. A, this is in a, a, an episode all about social media marketing. So I'll just keep it real superficial. Um, you could basically target in because Facebook has rules around real estate advertising, but you could say, Hey, within a 15 mile radius of my house, because that's a comfortable range for me to handle an investment property. Or you say, Hey, you know, this part of town is a good part for, is a good area for investment property. So I'm going to go focus over there and you can just run ads that have headlines like tenants driving you crazy question mark tenants, not making mortgage payments question mark. And you can run your ads and weed those people out. And that's probably going to be a little bit pricey per lead just because, you know, not everybody has that. And there's some things that you can drill down into some of the segmenting. Um, so it's an option. But one of the things, and I don't know if Karen, you have any thoughts on. Well, I just, I want to backtrack and I'm sorry if this is redundant, but I just think it's super important is I want everybody to understand this isn't preying on a landlord. So if, if they've had tenants that aren't paying or tenants that have been in, you know, pain or, um, or that have caused damage. This isn't preying on the landlord. It's actually helping the landlord get out of a bad situation. So I just wanted to kind of interject that a lot of times people will look at it differently, but most of the time the landlord is like, no, oh no, I'm so ready to go. Or they're ready to right. retire. But they're just tired of like, Heather said, tired of dealing with them. So well, I just saying, you're to just putting it out there. Like they don't have to call you. Yeah. It's not like yeah. you're, you know, going up to some guy at the park and saying, I heard you're a landlord and you know, grabbing his neck and say, sell me your house. You're saying, Hey, I'm a resource here. If, if you want to sell your home, reach out to me. Like nobody says they have to. So good point. Um, so, so Karen and I have done quite a bit over the years in direct mail. And, um, we were on an agent call a few months ago and, and the guy that runs it is not a huge fan of direct mail. So we got to talking and, and, uh, I said, what, what is it that you don't like about direct mail? He says, the problem is people don't commit to it. If you don't do direct mail for 12 months, then you're not going to see the rewards. And that's sort of true, but sort of not. Um, because most people don't understand direct response. So if you go and you say, hey, I'm going to do real estate, I'm going to do direct mail, and it's just traditional real estate, or even as an investor, I'm going to farm a certain neighborhood, and that's what I'm going to do. You're going to send out a postcard every month, probably from some website, they probably look mm -hmm. like everything else. And it doesn't work fast, because it's it's just like everything else. So you're just hoping that somebody happens to get that postcard the moment that they had a fight with their tenant and they're just had it. Not it's, when the dust is gets settled. lost in the shuffle. Yeah. Right. Um, so what Karen and I have always done is, is very targeted direct response mail. So this is, you know, it's copy, it's targeting, it's all of the factors to get your message in front of the right person. And I've had a much better response rate than that just historically. I've had as high on some campaigns is 11% response rate, which is huge. I um, may have to convert it and all that. And, and we can have another conversation mm -hmm. about direct mail and conversions at another time. Um, but that being said, you can be really effective. So I sent out 180 letters 
on Friday, got a call on Monday and have somebody that wants to buy a $1.4 million house in my neighborhood cash. So, uh, you know, I say this stuff because I don't want you to think it has to be a long-term play. So um, what you need to first do, now we've identified that these people are probably sick and tired and, um, you know, might want out. So the, the easiest thing to do is find what we call absentee owners. And an absentee owner is just simply somebody whose mailing address is different than the property address. In other words, if my property address is 123 Main Street and my mailing address is 124 Main Street, I am technically an absentee owner. So just to kind of clarify what that means, it doesn't mean that I'm out of state. Now you could do out of state, but um, that's, that's what an absentee owner is by definition. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Karen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, Heather was talking about the fact that you, you send these letters out and, you know, you're, we're marketing specifically to maybe absentee owners, but not, you know, um, or non-owner occupied properties, things like that, which, and Heather, did you mention this, that you can get where we can get those lists, how we market okay. to that? So there's a variety of different ways and Heather can add to this, but um, number one, it's really easy to get those from your title company. So a lot of, depending on where you live, the title companies can actually provide you with a list and you may say, hey, I want this from 123 Main Street and I want a five mile radius. And you can actually tell them, you know, and I want non-owner occupied properties. Um, in where I live, you can buy them from the, and we buy these lists guys, just so you know, um, and they vary depending on where you're buying them. So like title companies here charge 10 cents a name, um, but you could buy thousands of names for that price, right? Um, we can also buy them directly from the county, believe it or not, we can go to the county and get these same lists and they they will provide them too. So it's a legal way to get these lists. And then there's various marketing services um, where you can also buy these lists, like Heather mentioned earlier, you know, with the, the marketing guy that she met at an open house or an, a real estate numbers guy, I should clarify. But, um, but th so you can buy these lists in a variety of ways. Um, I would just encourage you to keep them updated. And, and these are just our non-owner occupied lists, basically that we keep in our database and we update twice a year. And if you're, um, I don't know, uh, you know, just depending on, um, if you have access to an agent or if you're in one of our markets, um, we can get them. I believe, do you have real list out there, Karen, or Remind yeah. or anything mm -hmm. like that? Yeah. <laughs> so we can pull those for you. And I do this for clients as well. Um, and sometimes I just do the marketing. We just say, hey, we're going to do a buyer's agreement. <clears throat> you're going to commit and I'll do all the marketing because I know what I'm doing on the marketing. Um, so yeah, you can get these. And um, like Karen said, you can call your county and you should call the tax assessor's office generally and they'll guide you. But um, in Austin, we're in Travis County, and I got the entire database from Austin for like 110 bucks. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> now you've got to do a lot more filtering and sorting if you buy that way. So mm -hmm. you're not going to just, and you may be able to get some of that, but generally speaking, they're not going to be like, oh yeah, sure, we'll give that to you just all sorted down. So you're going to have quite a bit of sorting to do. Right. So once I go ahead and get my database, then again, you still have to filter it. So generally speaking, I like to go, I've always been in Florida or Texas and, and, and Karen's in Colorado. I grew up in New England, so you could do out of state owners and it was a little bit different. You know, in bigger states, uh, you know, it, it gets real inconvenient when you have to go two or three hours to deal with a property. And so I kind of use that and say, okay, well, we're going to go out from, from that kind of radius at least this far. And so that takes care of the PO boxes. It takes care of, you know, the person that, you know, happens to live next door and just own the property next door. So you're, you're getting, but now that being said, with the conditions that we have now, um, you may not want to go that far. You may be okay with somebody in town because they may just still be sick and tired of dealing with the shenanigans from tenants. So that's kind of a judgment call. Um, you know, you can start with further, you know, you can start with out of state, then move in state far away and then move local if you want to kind of tackle it that way. So you're going to just basically sort through your database and just, you know, filter out everybody that's local. And um, if you're not using local and just kind of do some basic, basic level filtering to get this kind of core list that you're going to go ahead and use. Do you have anything on that, Karen? You know what, I, re I really don't, I mean, we filter all the time and then what you guys will find is once you do filter, you'll still get kickbacks in the mail, um, you know, and we always 
joke about like, if you're doing it right, you'll also get a few people that call and yell at you. Um, yes. <laughs> Take me off your list. How did you find my name? I'm like, well, it is from the county, you know, but, but you just have to be a little bit compassionate about those things and realize that some people don't know, or they've had something happen in their lives where it feels intrusive and it, it's just a piece of mail guys. So you just, I'm sorry, and remove them from the list or make sure you update your list by the ones that you get returned in the mail. Um, but this is far and away, and Heather will probably say the same, whether we're talking about real estate agents or real estate investors, this is one of our top uh, lead generation sources. And I think it is for you too, Heather. And Heather's really, you guys, the one that got Pete and I sort of you know, mm -hmm. hooked up with this whole idea of non-owner occupied. And so just to give you an idea, say, okay, well, that's fine. What do I say? Um, it's real simple. You just say, hey, Karen, my name's Heather Tankersley. Um, I'm interested in purchasing rental property for my family's future. A little bit about your family. You know, I've got two kids and it's important for me that we build our own <clears throat> future instead of relying on blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm potentially interested in your home at this address. Um, you know, I, I should have pulled up the letter. I could have read you one of ours, but, okay. but you know, Heather, I think what you're, where you're going, and this is why I think this is so successful is it's a very grassroots approach. And so what happens is you get all these kind of fun, slick little pieces of mail, you know, postcards and everything that Heather alluded to that looked the same earlier. Um, this is a very grassroots approach and it's a very honest and transparent kind of approach. And I think that's really what speaks to most people that do call back on these things as far as you know the the landlords that we're speaking to i think they go you know what this is a real person and they sure. like that not just so we buy houses cash well so does every other investor in, in the planet you know let Thank me look you. my, my high-end tech notes but um yeah. <laughs> i had I somebody <laughs> call me yesterday um <clears throat> yeah she says um my name's so and so. I got your letter back on. Um, it was dated December tenth, two thousand eighteen, and they kept it. Um, they're not keeping a postcard right. that says we buy houses. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you that happened to be probate, but I can't tell you how many times people have called me years later saying, "Hey, I saved your letter just because." Yeah, um, same here. So you really just want to be personal. Um, you know, I always just say, look, I'm, I'm not trying to waste your time. It needs to work for you and it needs to work for me. And if it doesn't, we can shake hands and, and move on. And I'm not going to badger you. I'm not going to beat you up. And, you know, this is just strictly a numbers game. And, and that's what the deal is. And I'll get anywhere from, depending on the timing, depending on the conditions, what have you. Karen, you might have different numbers, but anywhere from a one to 4% response rate. So meaning mm -hmm. for every hundred letters that I send out, I'll get one to four people that contact you and say, that's and, a lot. And, yeah, I was gonna say, and let's talk, well, number one, I was also gonna show you guys, and I'm, I'm gonna cover up the name here, but we just, we do the same thing. So once we get a, you know, a call back, which could be from a, a mailing we just sent out, it could be from something six months ago. We get calls too from two years ago, you guys, people will save these honest, transparent grassroots approach letters. So that's important. And then with Heather, when she was saying, you know, one to 4%, a lot of people would be like, well, that doesn't, you know, that's not good. Well, it is good because it, as you were saying, Heather, with the numbers, like if you send out, say you send out a hundred letters and you get one to four calls from those letters, well, how much does each house yield you in the long run? Well, if if Heather and I are going to list the house and say the house is a half a million dollars, well, that yields us a $15,000-ish commission. If we were going to hold it as a rental, which is what we're really talking about, that, you know, could give you, say, just, you know, $500 a month in cash flow, which is $6,000 that year, plus you get to use the, you know, all kinds of deduct tax deductions on it. So really, it's worth twice as much as that each year. It's worth $12,000 a year to you. And it appreciated at another, you know, say, and I'm just giving you guys low numbers here, say it appreciated, you know, at 5%. So it's worth five and a quarter next year. So in one year, you made what, $37,000 basically off of that house. So, so you know, you kind of have to look at this in a, a variety of ways. And the mailing costs you, you know, say four or five hours of your time because you're new at putting it together. And maybe it cost what, Heather, a couple hundred bucks? You could call it a hundred because you figure 50 cents for the stamp, mm -hmm. you pay a little bit for the list and, you know, materials. I mean, I just print them mm -hmm. all at home. 
Um, and just to talk about that, I, to this day, still use a first class American flag stamp. I handwrite mm. the um, name and then I use kind of just a silly return address label that, you know, has a sunflower, or a, you know, in Texas, a yeah. hook'em, you know, horn, you know, the, the UT mascot. So just yeah. something real simple like that. But <laughs> you reminded me, I had a student years ago when I sold a, a course that was just strictly all about how to find different motivated sellers. And, and this was one of the things in there. And I think this is what he had done was an absentee owner campaign. And the course was $800. And he called me ticked. He's like, this is the biggest waste of money. You should be ashamed of yourself. I spent $800 on your course, another $1,000 on mailings, and I only made $10,000. Okay. <laughs> so is this a testimony? Or is this a complaint? Like, because now right. the cost of the course starts to, you know, when you get your second deal, you can say it's $400. And so that sort of, sort of gets, you know, over time. And like, so where is the problem? Because if you were to tell me I could turn $1,500 into 10,000, I would be asking you how many times I could pay you your dollars. So you kind of have to look at it a little bit or not kind of, you have to look at it in terms of a return on investment. And you may not get a deal the first month or two months or three months mm -hmm. or four months. But if you're consistent, and another thing, is I don't know where it is, how it is where you are, but I know in Texas, your taxes are due pretty much in January. In Florida, mm -hmm. they're due by the end of March, I think, or the end of April. I don't even remember at this point. Um, I think it's the end of March and then you get a little bit of grace. And so if you send your campaigns like now, then people are also staring a tax bill down and going, okay, so I have tenants that aren't paying rent. I have no idea what the condition is of my house because most people or a lot of people just kind of, you know, put their head in the sand and say, this is just a mess. I don't want to deal with it. I'm just going to compartmentalize it over here and deal with it all later. So they don't even know what they're looking at inside their house that they own. They haven't, you know, all this stuff. And then they get a tax bill, you know, in Texas and Florida, our taxes are higher because we have no state income tax. Um, but even in Colorado, I'm sure you don't want a couple thousand dollar tax bill on top of not having had rent being paid, not knowing what the condition and the repairs are, all of that. So Mm -hmm. So if you send it out now within the next couple of months, you're probably going to have an, a higher response rate than if you send it in, let's say, July. Yeah, and I would, I was just uh, typing in a few notes here because I agree with you. I think the other thing, too, is um, not only about your tax bill, but uh, an important thing, in, you know, in Colorado, I mean, even though it's 60 degrees right now, you know, we will oh, get warmer cold. than we are. I know. Everybody's always surprised by that, but our Decembers are lovely. Um, but but the thing is, is it's a mental thing too. Like this is when our market, if it will slow down is boy, it's just starting to slow down a little bit this month. Um, but the other advantage to all this, you guys, is that, you know, you're marketing to them saying, I'll take it as is. So not only are you taking like, you know, that they, the, they're, they've lost a lot of money, their taxes are due, all that other stuff. But if they have a huge headache, their house is also probably not in great shape or you know, so the tenants could have done some, you know, damage, but, or the house needs to be updated, which is the case with a lot of rentals. And because the rental markets are so strong now, once those updates are down, are, are finished, instead of getting, you know, 900 a month, you might be getting 1500 a month. I mean, it could be substantial, but, but you're taking it as is. So that means you're taking it with all the junk, all the dirt, all the updates needed, all the broken dishwashers, all, you know, all those things that that takes a huge amount off of a seller's plate, which is a big advantage for you. And when you send out your letters, you should emphasize that. So, you know, there's there's nothing you have to do. And and I'm not saying you can't do an inspection. You can't discover something and renegotiate at the point of inspection. You can. But if you go into it up front saying this is as is, that takes a whole other financial burden off their plate. Exactly. Um, and so, you know, let's talk about that. You had a, had a sheet up, Karen. So let's say I get somebody to give me a call and they say, hey, I got your letter. I'm interested in potentially selling. Um, talk to me. You know, obviously, investor always wants to pay the le least amount possible. Seller always wants to get the most amount possible. So how do we go from, you know, how to, and, and especially now that we have Zillow, which we know is oh so accurate, but you know, everybody <laughs> thinks they know what, what everything is worth. Um, so how to eat you it? Know, like I had a friend who's like, oh, well, Zillow said my house is worth this much. I'm like, yeah, but it's not, yeah, you know, so and, and here's why. Yeah. Um, so how do you, what do you do? Like when somebody gets on the phone with you and calls y'all, what do you mm -hmm. say? How do you start that? How do you 
evaluate the deal? It's a great it's a great question, Heather. And we we do what we call a setter. So one of the people in our office actually takes the call, and then she fills out a um, a seller call in interview sheet, basically. And with that, of course, we're trying to build a little bit of rapport and trust. Um, but we also need basic information. So we always get you know the time and date that they call, um, and that's mostly so we we can keep track of it, but also so we can reference back to it um, along with our cycle of communication. So how often have we spoken to them and when? Um, because as you said, sometimes these will go on for two or three years and that's fine. We track every single one. We keep every single one on file. Every single one gets a call in sheet. Um, so we get the address, the contact person's name and phone number. Um, we ask you know, for any other um, information, email, et cetera. Um, you always wanna make sure that the property address is at the same as the other address that they're giving you. So a lot of times they'll be different. But basically, um, you know, what we're doing is we're just trying to find out overall information about the home. And like I said, sort of build rapport. And this is with the setter. So this is with the person who takes the phone call in our office. And we really want to um, just listen. So, you know, well, tell me a little bit about your home. And of course, as Heather has said before, too, everybody's going to tell you how great it is. But you're also going to start to hear little points of pain throughout, you know, and, um, and that's, that's important to note is when they start to talk about the points of pain, because of those are the ones that you want to come back to and say, you know what, I'm really sorry that you're dealing with that. I'm so sorry. Yeah, we've experienced that in the past. And um, the thing is, is you want them to feel as though they're, you know, this is just kind of, um, you know, psychology 101, but you, you want them to feel as though they're being heard. And that's important because they're also going to give you a lot of good information that you can now um, utilize when you go back to negotiate um, so that you can find out exactly, you know, what their points of pain are and speak to those. Um, but in addition to that, we also want to find out like, you know, what's their timing um, and what kind of price point they think the home is worth. And for us, their main reason why they want to sell. And then we confirm a time um, that that either myself or my husband will call them back depending on what the lead is or who the lead is. So you that's, know, th those are kind of the highlights. One thing I learned from a friend of mine who is, is one of the quote unquote gurus out there that, you know, since I'm not really teaching investing necessarily like from a platform and courses mm -hmm. and programs right now. So somebody says, whose product should I purchase? So there's a gentleman and I learned from him years ago, um, I went to a seminar of his and he taught me a lot about direct mail and just the personal touch. And there's been a handful that have been, been kind of cool about this, but two, one is um, Greg Pinio, another one by the name of Robert Sheeman, who actually met at a real estate association meeting in Miami after we'd picked up his book in the bookstore. And since, you know, had gone on and became really good friends, I've written parts of his books and, and, um, and, and so on. And so both of them told me, talk about cats. And I said, what are you talking yeah. about? They said, get the relationship. Like yeah. they called you about real estate. They're going to come back. And, you know, think of it, you're on a highway and you got screaming kids in the back car, mm -hmm. back of the car. And now I can say after having done two long road trips, maybe not I'm hungry. Maybe it's, I got to go potty. Yeah. You know, all these little off ramps that they take you, the cat, the this, the that, the politics, even if you don't agree with their politics, listen, because eventually they're going to get back on the highway and get to the destination or you can route them back to the highway, but talk to them about whatever it is that they are wanting to talk about and it'll eventually circle back, but you're building that relationship with them. And I can't tell you how far that will go because, I mean, I remember speaking at the Miami Real Estate Investor Association on probate. And at the end of my talk, one of the slides I used had a, a sample property and he came up to me, he goes, you stole that property from me. And I'm, pardon me? Because we oh. were very ethical in what we did. And he says, well, you didn't actually steal it, but we offered more money to the seller. And she said, she just trusted you more. So she went with your offer. And I was like, well, there you go. There's your, there's your uh, million dollar lesson from tonight is, is what I told the guy, not, you know, kind of half joking, but kind of half not. Mm -hmm. And if they like you and they trust you, it isn't always going to be about money. There's other factors. This is a people business. So you need to, to also really try to connect. And it's not just being an order taker. It's trying to get to mm -hmm. what's really got you frustrated. Why do you want to sell? Is and it it's, 
Oh, sorry, Heather. Yeah, Heather is hitting on the number one key point. You know that when she says talk about cats, that's exactly what I mean by listen and build rapport. It's exactly what you need to do. And I used to do a sample when I would teach um, all of our like higher end home staging courses, where I'd walk up to somebody and be like, you know, hi, my name's Karen, and of course, you know, we wanted to sell them a staging. And the example was, you know, I love I love your shirt, and right away somebody's like oh my gosh thank you so much like did you did you where did you get that did you buy that here locally and you just start to build a rapport it all based on a shirt so it's similar to talk about cats but it's just you know and you guys will find a path and and for those of you that don't feel authentic with that all you're doing is finding a path to authenticity and that's you know that's the key to success it's just like cats if heather said you know let's talk about your cats i'm like i'm a dog person so it's not like, you know, it's not like she's, it's, you know, it's inauthentic. She's building rapport to get to, oh my gosh, you're a dog person. So am I, you know, cats. I, that's so funny. I'm allergic to cats too. You know, I mean, so that, that's really where it, you and, know, and I, I think certainly wouldn't to... bring up cats just so you <laughs> just an example, but, and I know Heather, we're, it looks like we're going to have to wrap yep. up here in a couple minutes, but um, what are your we talked a lot about like direct mail, um, authenticity, um, the fact that people will, um, you know, wait a year or two. Um, we've talked about, um, you know, direct response. Um, what are some of the final things that we want to kind of discuss? I think it just talk? comes down to, you know, once you've got all that, um, you've got to just figure out this is kind of the brass tacks, right? Where does it come down to? So, you know, they want $200,000 for their home. You want to pay 150. Is there any wiggle room? Is there anywhere to make it work? So just a simple, simplified um, math, if you will, yeah. is so if you're holding it for long term, you don't want to look at appreciation. And I know when we're in record appreciation markets, it's easy to say, well, but I can make 20% a year, year over year. We don't know what's going to happen. There's a lot of predictions out there calling for two very different paths. Right. So you don't want to make predictions on appreciation. You want to say, is the rental market strong regardless of which path we go? Mm -hmm. um, and if it is, am I likely to sustain or increase my rental income? Because when the market crashed in 2008, 2009, a lot of people were not able to keep that income because as people started to face foreclosure, they drop rents to try to just stay afloat, just try to stay afloat, to try to stay afloat. Mm -hmm. Those are not the circumstances we have now, but you want to make sure you say, hey, if I'm getting a thousand bucks a month for this, none of the economic predictions that people are making or, or factors that I can see are going to change that. So it's right. a little bit different because you say, hey, for me to do this, I need to make $250 a month positive cash flow plus, plus the tax deductions. Um, if you were flipping, which we can have a, a different conversation about, it's a very different, um, it's a different story. You still want to build in some equity and you know, if you had to sell it next month to be able to get out of it. But so you want to know how much you know, basically what are the numbers? How much is it going to cost me to get this property? How am I going to earn? If I want to earn 10% on my money over the next year, if I put $10,000 down, I need to be able to earn a thousand dollars positive cash flow for this to work. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of repairs, what kind of financing? So you need to just kind of know those numbers and then you just back into a price. It doesn't matter what the seller wants and it doesn't matter what you want. It has to work. You just say, look, based on the numbers that I have, the most that I can pay for this property is 147,500. And if they say the least I can sell it for is $150,000, then you need to walk away, you know, or you need to do something creative to, to manipulate some other numbers in another way. So um, I'd say the numbers is, is really important to know what do you need out of it? Don't get emotional because people get so, oh, I got a call. I got this. Let's make it work. Let's make it work. And then they end up upside down and in a bad way. Yeah. And I think my, my, I like that numbers are key guys. You got to figure out how to get those numbers to work for you. And my final kind of way to wealth strategy, if you will, is um, consistency. And so I think that, you know, we talked about um, direct mail and direct response and all, you know, basically we refer to it as our cycle of communication. And I emphasize that even on our call-in sheets with our date and our time and, you know, how we keep those on file. And you really have to um, be consistent with how your um, doing your mailings and how you're doing your follow-ups. So I think if I had to say like the one key success is be consistent, decide when you're going to mail them out, how often you're going to mail them out, where they go, and then what your cycle of follow-up is. And just because somebody says no once, as long as they don't say, take me off your list, doesn't mean 
that they're saying no forever. It just means no today. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean no tomorrow. And so it's why it's important to have that consistency and that cycle of communication. Absolutely. So um, guys, I hope that was helpful. I know we kind of went into to some of the detail pieces, but you know, a lot of times you hear just superficial and no detail and then sometimes it's too much detail. So we kind of wanted to do a little bit of a balance and give you some details and then also, you know, just kind of some broader um, overview. So essentially what we talked about is, and I don't want to say taking advantage because people think of it in a bad way, but you're, you're looking at the opportunity that the current economy, market cycle conditions, what have you have presented. And you're saying, okay, how can I work within these parameters and make this work and do something for my family? So um, we talked about just the opportunity with the eviction moratorium going up. And by the way, this works even without COVID. I'm just saying there's a greater potential opportunity now. I mean, this is a long-term strategy that, you know, can start now and end a decade later. So yeah. this is not an only COVID. This is just a, this is maybe a time where you might have a little bit higher response rate, if you will. So he talks right. about, you know, finding, you know, where to get the lists, the kind of basics of a letter, um, how to sort of evaluate the property, and then just basics about numbers. We could do a whole call on number crunching um, because there's so many pieces of it. So that's sort of it in a nutshell. Um, if you are in Florida, Texas, Colorado, we're certainly happy to help you find those properties. You say, you know, all that's cool, but I'd rather you do the work. So we're happy to do the work too. You know, we just got to get a plan in place together and, and go through some certain things and, and we can do the work for you. Or if you have deals in your area and we can't necessarily help you from a negotiation standpoint, we're also still happy to help you evaluate and just kind of take a look at the deals for you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And find the best resources for you in your area. So just leave us questions, comments. We're happy to talk to you guys and we appreciate you being here today. Awesome. You guys have a great rest of your week and we'll see you again uh, next week. Bye guys. Bye-bye.